because I'm not really convinced that it's the safest thing to do. I don't really feel like I'm in any danger, so I don't bother putting on my seatbelt. I find I'm terribly uncomfortable. My problem with the seatbelt is that it gives me a rash right across my neck here, and I just can't take the time to buckle up and unbuckle constantly in and out. They're sort of inconvenient, but I'm a good driver, and I don't really need them. I'm Terry Earwood, and I'll be one of your instructors for the next couple of days in our advanced driving school. We'd like to welcome you here. We're going to try to show you more about what you can do with a car in the next couple of days than you've learned the entire time you've been driving a car. We're going to do this through a nice, safe, controlled environment, putting you through some different maneuvers. We're going to tie a package together called the system. The system is you, the car, and your safety belts. Before we go out to our skid pad area, I would like to introduce you to a gentleman that actually makes his living driving a race car, Mr. David Hobbs. David? Pretty hard to imagine, Terry, but there it is. Some people do. Uh, racing is a glamorous sport, and it's also dangerous. But it's not as dangerous as it used to be. And part of the reason for that is because of the systems that Terry's been talking about have been developed for racing cars as well. I mean, we go up to speeds of 200 miles an hour at some of the circuits we're at, but if you'll just come outside, I'll show you the machine, and we can have a look at what makes it as safe as it can be. Because racing on the racetrack and driving on the highway are two very different things. Start with the racetrack, something like two or three miles long, so we know every bump and every curve in it. Uh, there's a low traffic density out there, and most of the traffic out there is being driven by pretty responsible, uh, very competitive drivers. Um, I've got this fire suit on, and we're well controlled by outside forces. We have flag marshals giving us good flags to tell us when there's oil on the track or debris on the track or someone's crashed. Uh, I'm fixed up audio and visually with my own pit that can tell me the same sort of thing. And hopefully, uh, all the traffic will be going in the same direction. Then, of course, the car itself. The monocoque chassis. Aluminium honeycomb, aircraft-type material. Incredibly strong. Very, very strong. We have huge, sticky tyres to hold us down on the road. We also have enormous, incredibly well-ventilated brakes to bring us down from high speed. Huge capability. Pull this 2,000-pound car down from... 100 miles an hour to zero in three, three and a half seconds. The bodywork and even the suspension to a certain extent is all designed to be ripped off in the event of any major catastrophe, leaving the driver sitting in this very, very strong safety cell. The engine, obviously tremendously powerful, very reliable. All the ancillary bits of the car, the suspension parts, this beam, the rollover cage, are all made of the very best materials. And then, of course, we come to the actual cell itself where the driver sits. Everything comes to hand. The instruments are all right in front of his eyes, the steering wheel, the gear lever, the sway bar adjusters, the brake pedals, everything is all laid out for the driver. The seats are all individually matched to each driver, they're molded around the driver. And of course, last but not least, is the seat belt, a multi-point belt. You have a lap strap, a crutch strap, and a shoulder strap. And these not only, of course, work in the event of an accident, but they actually hold you into the car into that form-fitting seat during the race itself. David showed you some of the features of his system that makes driving at race speed safe. The driver is well prepared and well trained. The race car has both active and passive safety features built in. Active features David can manipulate like steering, a powerful engine, and brakes. Passive features like roll bars and a breakaway body. And most important in the system is the safety belt because it holds the driver in place in the vehicle. You're going to learn how to manipulate the same active features of your automobile that David talked about with the race car. Your car has power. Your car has the brake system. And then your car has the steering. 
we can combine these features and we can show you what's available. We can show you how to better use these active features. But first, before we begin to practice, let's discuss some passive features that are built into all of your modern automobiles. We have shock absorbing bumpers in the case of a crash. We have guard beams that are built into our side doors to help protect you in an impact. We have shatterproof safety glass in case you were to hit the windshield. We have a front end sheet metal design that will actually accordion under impact and absorb some of the shock to keep it out of the driver's compartment. Now let's acquaint ourselves with the cockpit. You actually have a cockpit orientation when we get in the automobile. The first thing is you want to get in as much seat as possible, get nice and comfortable in the seat, get your legs at the proper angle and your arms at the proper angle. You want to be able to adjust your mirrors where you can see out the entire rear window and see down just barely get the edges of your cars with the side view mirrors. You want to know where your gauges are, the speedometer, the tachometer, fuel, oil pressure. You want to be able to reach a turn signal or reach a wiper or reach your lights without having to look for it. Let's work on your hands at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. That'll keep us square with the four corners of the car at all times. Now, the most important thing that ties us into the entire system is our safety belt. The seat belt for three-point design with belts in the rear as well, ergonomically designed. And if you notice, they are inertia type, that the minute the car begins to bounce or under any impact whatsoever, it locks you in the seat. And no matter the circumstance, no matter the toss, you are glued behind the wheel to continue driving the car regardless of the attitude of the vehicle. What about airbags, Terry? Airbags are a new technology that in some cars are built into the steering wheel and to a knee bar. But keep in mind, airbags are a supplemental restraint system that only work after the fact. The seat belt is actually your primary restraint. The airbags come out once you've had the impact. We're here to teach you how to avoid that next impact. This is an accident evasion maneuver, not participation. So let's go get on a skid pad and evade some accidents. Great. Okay. Okay. Right. All right, Kevin, we talked about what the car can do. We've talked about the seat belt, how it holds you in place. And now let's see what the third part of the system, which is you. Let's see what you can do with the car here on the skid pad. Okay. I'm going to tell you to punch it. And when you do, when you feel the skid, just come back out of the gas and try to correct it. Okay. Nice and steady, a little more speed, looking good. All right, nail it hard. Oops. Now, once the car begins to fishtail like that, just come back out of the power. The power is one of the active parts of the car but too much power at the wrong time can get us in a bit of trouble. Okay. So let's try it again. A little more speed. Kick it hard. That's enough. A lot of wheel this way. And recover it. Now, no power. No power. Once the car begins to slide. Now, did you notice how the seat belt held you in place? As we were sliding back and forth, mm -hmm. the seat belt keeps you right in place and enables you to read what the car is asking you to do next. I think if it wasn't for the seat belt, I'd be in your lap. Very good. You would be. And kick it hard. Full recovery. Good. Good. Good job. If you don't have anti-lock brakes, you can brake a car real hard in a straight line. But once you've asked the front tires to turn, they can't brake hard and turn simultaneously. But you can mix and match these items. You can turn and brake, but you have to give up some of your braking to be able to steer the car. We're going to do a brake turn maneuver here under safe pylon conditions. Jeff will come down at this point and demonstrate to us simulating a panic stop. We will turn the lights red, and as the lights turn red, you will see that he is able to apply the brake pedal and turn the car, but stop in these pylons, hopefully without hitting the cones. At 45 miles an hour, you'll see him brake fairly hard and ask the car to turn into its curve. Without locking a tire, the car begins to turn. We call it trailing brake, where you're trailing out of the brake pedal. It's just feathering back the brake pedal, but still slowing it down at the same time. If you do it just on the money, actually the right front tire will make more noise than the rest of the car. As you ask the car to turn right, you unload the right front tire, take the weight off of it, and she slows down more than the rest of the car, and it begins to squeal just a little bit. If you get both front tires locking some, the car will not respond, the car will not turn, and you must back out of the brake system some. If you lock the front tires, you may as well unbolt the steering wheel and hand it to your passenger because they're doing just as good a job of driving as you are. All right, so 
Susan. Good job. Nice. You got a lot of speed down initially. Then as you ask the car to turn, it started locking the right front because you begin to unload that tire. The minute you realize it, you backed out just a little bit and still stopped a little shorter than last time. What we're combining here is three of the active features you've taken for granted the entire time you've been driving the car. Active features meaning we were steering the car, we were braking it pretty hard, and the harder you braked and turned the seat belt really tied you in that seat, and that's the part that ties the whole car together. So you can perform evasive maneuvers should something occur. Good job. That's the idea. That's the idea. Now that we've spent an enjoyable morning on the skid pad, just sliding around, spinning the cars backwards, and really feeling how the safety belt held you in place in that seat. We'd like to expose you to a different point of view. And with us this morning, we have Dr. Scott Geller, professor of psychology from Virginia Tech. Good morning. I'm a behavioral psychologist, and I've been studying for almost a decade ways to get people motivated to wear that safety belt. And I've heard every excuse in the book. And you know, no excuse is a rational one. We get in our car, we got places to go, people to meet, and we don't think about reaching up and putting on that shoulder strap and lap belt combination. Oh, on any one trip, the probability of being in an accident is minuscule. But in a lifetime of driving, it reaches 50-50. Nope, the best defense against the drunk, against the uneducated driver, is to wear your own safety belt on every trip. We have to get people involved in the idea of wearing a safety belt. You know, as a teacher, I think of the motto, and I try to live by this, tell them and they'll forget. Demonstrate and they'll remember. Involve them and they'll understand. You've been involved the last two days in learning about the automobile and how it's part of an entire system. And right now, I'd like to involve you in a demonstration to illustrate that even at slow speeds, the safety belt is necessary. Let's come meet the convincer. Okay, Steve, put on that system that you're used to wearing. Uh, Steve, this is only a six mile an hour crash. This is the kind of crash that people have in parking lots. It's a, it's a pseudo crash. It doesn't really happen. You stop suddenly, just six miles an hour. I want you to think if you could really hold yourself back. People think they can hold on the steering wheel, or in fact, hold the child back by putting out their arm. I want you to imagine, see if you really could do that. Okay. Just six miles an hour. Here we go. Could you hold the child back? Yeah. Uh, I, my dog, maybe. My <laughs> child, no. Whoa, that yeah, really got you right here. Oh, yeah. Convinced? Yeah. Nope. The best defense against the drunk, against the uneducated driver, is to wear your own safety belt on every trip. If you're not buckled up, you can't read the car as quickly. You're hanging on to the wheel now instead of flowing with the car. And that's what we're trying to develop is this flow with the vehicle regardless of, of where the car is going. That belt nice and snug keeps us pinned in that seat. The tighter it is, the better you feel. The more you become one-on-one -on -one with that car instead of just sitting in the seat like sitting on your living room couch trying to steer your television. But it's not a package unless you're belted in the car to keep you snug in that seat where no matter what happens on the highway, you become the better driver because you are part of the system.